All right, up next we have Tim Bariki. He is a web performance architect at Akamai. He runs frustrationindex.com and also scalemates.com, the largest and most performant 3D modeling site with 40,000 visits per day. That's pretty impressive, right? He also, I found out, has two daughters who that frequently come across slow robe sites that need daddy's help. I'll let you him tell you more about them. But everyone, please welcome Tim to the stage. Good morning, everybody. I hope everybody is alive and kicking. Before I start, I want to say that I like tuning things. I like making things better. And this conference so far is awesome. Great food, great speakers, great chats. Everything is fine. Now, PPK, there is like one small little thing which we could improve next year. And it's basically related to our code of conduct. <laughs> Thank you. Now, I'm not going to speak about Robin today, or maybe just a little bit. I'm talking to you today about noise cancelling run. And in my day job at Akamai, where I try, try to make our customers' websites as fast as possible, also when working on my own website, I use real user monitoring. And I really love real user monitoring. And why? Because it tells me how my website behaves under real world conditions. Fast browsers, slow browsers, good connections, bad connections, somebody in Australia, somebody in Belgium, I basically see how everything works. Now, of course, it's not because I love real music monitoring. There is something else I love in my life. And those are, of course, my two little daughters. Now, Rum and my daughters actually have one thing in common. They can be very, very noisy. And some parental advice here during the pandemic, the solution for my daughters was quite easy some noise-canceling headphones, and problem solved. For RUM, it's a little bit more complex. Well, actually, not that complex. It's quite easy. So let's explain that today. And if you implement the techniques I apply here, your RUM data will make more sense. Whenever you make a change, you will instantly spot it. You will see less fluctuations. And also, if you correlate RUM data with business metrics, they will also make more sense. So stay tuned. Now, if I show a graph like this, everybody is basically happy, right? And if your graph looks like this, you don't need noise cancelling run. Then everything is fine. However, how often does it happen that you hope you see a nice change like this, and then it's only, hmm, or even worse, no change at all. I've been there. And the reason is simple. There are three sources of noise which contribute to what you hope to get and what you actually get. And issue number one is we have this single percentile fetish. My kids, they have like this single color fetish, blue or purple. We, when you talk, we either, oh, what's your, what's your percentile you look at? Oh, the P75, the P50. Oh, no, I look at the P95. We have this single percentile fetish. And the problem with that is, I'll explain that straight away. But first, let's double check that to make sure, because I will use percentiles a lot, and you really need to know what percentiles are. So suppose you have these 12 measurements. In order to get the median or the P75, what do you do? You order them from very fast, to very slow, and in the middle is the median or the P50. So 50% is faster than this value, or 50% is also slower than this value. P75, 25% is faster, uh, is slower, 75% is slower. Same for P25, P95, P whatever you are looking at. And that's fine, it's simple. Now, the problem is, if you just look at one, or you focus on one, you have this issue. I also work for a CDN, and 
This is a common pattern I see on many websites. If you're looking at the fastest percentiles, they're like very, very fast. You have like a big gap, and then you have some very, very slow responses. And this is basically cache hit, fast, served from the CDN, cache miss. You need to go to the origin. The origin is slow. You need to go from Australia to Belgium or to the Netherlands. You have some latency, like Matt said earlier. And what is the option? Let's increase the TTL. Now, if you increase the TTL, you get more cache hits and less cache misses. Is this a good change or not? Yes, this is a good change. Now, if you only look at one percentile, and I have a lot of customers, for example, the cool ones, they like to look at the P95 or the P99. If you just look at this value, this was no impact at all. If you're looking at the P75, huh, everybody now with the Core Web Vitals looks at the P75, it would be, hmm, maybe, why did we spend so much time in order to get so little benefits? On the other hand, if you, in this case you look at the median, you might have the impression that all your users got faster, while only a portion of the users are faster. So the solution is simple. Always, always, always analyze multiple percentiles. Otherwise, you create blind spots for no reason. Now, a word of caution. Suppose these fake numbers here at the bottom, you do a deploy, and these are the new numbers. What do you see? All of them got better. Yes, the P95, the P50, the P67, the P32, everything got better. Now, does it mean that all users got a better user experience? The typical answer is yes. Now, very often, what do you do? In this case, it's actually not. The only thing I did is the slowest response, let's say my users in Australia, I found a fix, magical fix for them, and I made them super fast, the same as in the Netherlands. Yes, all my percentiles improved, but I only impacted a small portion of my users. And why does this matter? Suppose you're looking at business metrics and you say, oh, all our percentiles improved, our bounce rate should improve, everything should improve, we should make more money. And you don't see that correlation. Why? You only impacted a small portion of the users, although all your percentiles were. So that's a word of caution. Let's go to issue number two, traffic patterns. You don't see this issue in synthetic. And I'm not, I, I love synthetic as well, so that's not a problem. But with synthetic, you're always testing on the same conditions. And with run data, you have certain patterns. If you're looking at a long term trend at N in any run tool, you will see this pattern. And it's basically super easy. This is the weekend. Or depending on the audience, your weekends could be faster. Why? Different network conditions, different devices people browsing less or more because they have more time, basically a lot different. For some of them, you will also see on Wednesday a small change because, for example, in Belgium on Wednesday, that's when dads or moms stay at home for their kids, and that's like a different thing. Now, why does it matter? Suppose you do a deploy on a Tuesday, and a few days later you go into RUM and you say, I want to check if my improvements got better if my changes got, uh, did make an improvement or not. And very often you see, oh, I compared this day, since the day of my deploy plus three days, and I do minus three days since the previous deploy, which makes sense. However, in this case, you would see a performance improvement while there is actually no performance difference at all. Because you add two days of slow weekend, and you compare it to three fast weekdays. So what is better? And my advice is always, always, always compare apples to apples and compare it, for example, to the same three days before. Now, you not only have long-term patterns, you also have daily patterns. So here you're seeing the backend time, so time to first byte, at, I think, the P90, doesn't, in the end, doesn't matter. 
But what you're seeing here is that magic doesn't matter. At the bottom, you see 750 milliseconds. Depending on the time of the day, the fastest hour every single day on my website is 8 p.m. It's 100 milliseconds faster than the normal day. During the night, my performance every night drops with 100 milliseconds. So depending on the time of the day, there's like a 200 milliseconds difference. What does it mean? Suppose you do a deploy and you look at your run data and you compare the first three hours after the deploy to the three hours before, you could come to the conclusion, hey, great change. You could also de-roll back because you thought it was degraded while it's actually not. So take into account your daily patterns as well. So compare apples to apples. That's already, I would say, the basics. If you're looking at the run data, that's the basics. Now let's look into the fun part. RUM contains a lot of irrelevant data, useless data, worthless data, whatever you say. And my advice here, let's straight away go, always focus on human visible navigations. Or if it's not human, if it's not visible, and if it's not a navigation, skip it by default, by default. Let me explain why that matters. And the noise levels of non-human visible navigations is 22%. So one out of four or one out of five, depending on your website, is noise. And there are three sources of noise, one 15%, one only 1%, we will cover that later, and then 6%. Now, a little bit on my website, so I run the largest scale modeling website in the world. This is one of the 500,000 product detail pages. And if you don't know scale modeling, it's the coolest hobby on this planet. Much cooler than sword fighting. <laughs> the, so if you don't know scale modeling, you basically buy a kit, you open the box, you have a lot of plastic sprues. You cut them, you glue them, you paint them, you airbrush them, you weather them, and you try to make a beautiful model like this. And you spend basically an, uh, one year, two years, like I do, on a model like this. Now, I don't only have the largest scale modeling website in the world, I also have the fastest scale modeling website in the world. Thank you. Because my day job at Akamai, when I come home, I, my lovely kids, I give them hugs, I play with them, all these things, and then they go to sleep, the noise stops, my wife starts watching Grey's Anatomy, and then I pick my laptop and I try to make the website as fast as possible. So early hints, all the cool stuff, early hints, uh, speculation rules, broadly compression, CDN, image optimizations, AVIF, I try to do everything in there. Now, how I got there, I also had to implement and look at human visible navigations. Otherwise, I wouldn't have been able to get rid of the outliers. So let's look at navigations. So the human visible navigations, so we start at the end. If you go to the browser console and you type in this little snippet, you get three values. Either a navigation, the user clicked on the link, went to the next page. Either a back forward navigation, the user clicked on the back button. Or developers like us, you hit the reload button. So three options. If you do that in run data on my website, you see that 85% are navigations, and then 15% is what I call noise from a real user monitoring perspective. And the reason is noise is basically on the next slide. Here you see the waiting time. So this is time to first byte without DNS, TCP, SSL handshake, redirects, just browser sends a GET request and I get my response back. And what do you see? That 
the navigations I care about is 96 milliseconds. But because 14% of very, very, very fast back-forward navigations are added in the mix, this results in the total time being improved. Now, why does this matter? Suppose, you, I work for a CDN, suppose you make some caching changes like before, and you want to measure the impact. On which of these groups do you see the impact? On the back-forward navigations? No impact. So, one of the reasons of noise is because you try, you look at all your data, and you look at a portion which does not, is not impacted by it. So by default, when I tune, the, and the same is not only for the CDN, it's also for the backend. If you're tuning database queries and you're trying to shave off some milliseconds there, on the back forward navigations, typically they don't have any influence. Now, what is the impact? Remember that fake data? If you add very, very fast back forward navigations, you add, let's say, here three at the beginning, what happens? Your percentiles change. In this case, you will actually, at the top you see the previous, and let me double check, you can see it, yes. At the top you see the previous percentiles. So the P50 is now a lot, a lot better. The P25, the lower percentiles, are shifted a lot. The P95 maybe just a little, a little bit. You might say, Tim, noise levels. We never look at the P50. We never look at the P25. Who cares? The problem is, noise levels can be different. For example, like every website, I have a home page. People do a search, because it's a, uh, uh, the search engine is very important. Next, they click on a kit. That's the base model. That's what I call product detail page kits. And then, like, in the real world, you can pay a lot of extra money on additional sets, like adding additional details, change uh, different markings, some figurines. You can basically add some additional aftermarket sets for the product detail pages. Now, why do you care? I know you're not scale models. That's fine. But let's look at the noise levels of these four pages. So the back forward noise on my search is... 20, almost 23%. Now, this basically turned into a blind spot. So for me, I know Temi said that search is not always the most important, which is okay, but for me, the search engine is like the key part of the website. And I want it to be fast. And for years, I thought it was fast. Why? Because it contained 23% of lightning fast back forward navigations, and the actual performance of my search engine was more here. So that's a problem. Another problem is I spent hours and hours and hours, a few sessions of Grey's Anatomy, trying to understand why are my kids' detail pages faster than my aftermarket pages. Because they all have, they basically share the same template. It's the same hero image, the same stuff, every, basically everywhere, everywhere. So I tried, is it just, uh, there were like just a few queries different, so that must have been the difference. I spent hours and hours and hours tuning, and I was never able to understand the difference. And the reason is basically simple. If I looked at the median, one was faster. Why? Because it had more lightning fast back forward navigations. And why is that? Actually, now I forget, for the example, for the search, why does a search page have a lot of back-forward navigations? You do a search, oh, right-click, open a new tab, or you click and you hit the back button. You click, you hit the back button. You click, you hit the back button. And the same is true for these aftermarket sets. If you're looking at a product detail page, at the bottom, hey, here are some aftermarket sets, so you click on the first one, you go back to that product detail page. You click on the second one, you go back to the product detail page. That's the reason. Another example here from uh, Ample's RUM, which I use, is here you see the, the typical red, green, orange, where 
the impact of these very, very fast back forward navigations is seen on the total bottom row. So my actual performance is actually slower than without the noise. And I hear you say, Tim, 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 we don't care about your stupid scale modeling website because our site is different. And I agree. Last year, here at the performance conference here, the RUM archive was introduced. And the RUM archive is a multiple aggregated customers' data, all anonymized, where you can spot certain trends. It's open source, and if you go to rumarchive.com, you will see that. And what does the RUM archive tell you? That for all these websites, which are not scalemates, that the noise on desktop, or sorry, on mobile is a little bit lower. It's around, uh, let's say, 11%. And on desktop, it's going into the, uh, I have no, I miss my glasses, uh, the 10%. Now, it's not as much, but it's more than enough to skew your data and to put you in the wrong direction. Another graph from the RUM archive. So here you see the, a histogram of the time to first byte. And what do you see? That, that back forward navigations, the orange part in the beginning, that there is like a big chunk of very, very fast back forward navigations. The, those make the median and the P75 look better. And basically, the RUM archive is one year old today, which is awesome. And Nick Jansma, he's an amazing colleague of mine. I have plenty of amazing colleagues. Nick is smart. Nick is humble. Nick's, Nick has cool hobbies. Nick is friendly. Nick is basically everything you want from a nice colleague. Another new thing is introduced today, this is new today, is RUM Insights. So RUM Archive is cool, it's open source, but you needed BigQuery to actually query it. So it costs money, you need to set up an account, and although it's not that complex, it adds some effort. So RUM Insights is something new, and it's, if you go to rumarchive.com since today, you will actually see a lot of the insights in an easy, consumable way without actually having to need to query things. So the screenshots I shared before were basically RUM insights. Now, RUM archive is done by a team of people at Akamai, and RUM insights, RUM insights has one downside. <laughs> Robin, 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 Robin. Tammy said, work harder, not don't work harder, work smarter. You should have been smart enough to know that I come after you. <laughs> now, Robin, how Robin thinks he looks. Robin, can you please stand up? Now, I want you to stay there. Now, we know Robin is a sword fighter. Hmm? 13th century, 14th century, whatever. Now, let's... No, none of us are sword fighters. So, Robin, suppose you would have a sword in your hand. Are you able to hit me from that location? The answer is no. Is that smart? No. Because <laughs> next to scale modeling, I will now have for next year, a new hobby, which is called longbow arrow shooting. <laughs> Thank you, Robin. <clears throat> back to the noise. So, back forward noise is really impact that deploy can really add uh, things. So if you're example, any backend changes, if you include the fast back forward noise, you will not see a big impact as you think, because you think, oh, it impacts all my traffic, while it only impacts 80% of your traffic. Now, 
Next is visible. What do I mean with visible? If in the browser you type document.visibility state, you get visible. And if you type it in the console, you will always see visible because at that point in time, the tab is visible. However, if you do that in RUM and you capture that data, you get three different values, potential values. One is always visible. It means, I'm, let's say I'm in Google, I click on a link, I stay in the same tab, so the page starts loading in a visible state, and by the time the RUM data is sent, let's say on page load or a little bit later, the page was still visible. Always visible. Partially hidden means, or partially visible, how you want to say it, is, for example, I'm in Google, I right-click on a search result, I open it in a new tab, so the page starts invisible, and then before the beacon is sent, I click on that new tab, and it's loaded. The other way around can happen as well. I navigate on a website, I open a link, and for whatever reason, maybe because it takes too long, I switch tabs, so you start visible. And easy, nothing special. Now, why is this noise? The reason is very simple on the next slide, based on the RAM data. This is, again, on scalemates. My largest contentful paint is 4.75 seconds at the 95th percentile, which is good. Now, if you're looking at the total, it's actually slower, 4.89. And I would say the noise itself is fine. Now, always hidden is 7% 7, 7 of that is 8 seconds. Now, why would a page, when it's partially hidden, be slower than a page which is fully visible? Because browsers are smart. Browsers focus on the stuff you see, and the moment something is on a hidden tab, it will not allocate all priorities to render that hidden page. It will focus on rendering the page you actually see on screen. So that result, if that it means, is the moment your page is somehow hidden, that for the browser, the performance no longer matters that much, which is okay. Now, how many of you have ever done a performance project where you want to improve the performance of a hidden page? Just like my skills on sword fighting, Now, the reason why it's partially hidden is slower than always hidden is just because I don't just don't have enough samples. So I don't have a meaning reason why the bottom one is twice as big. I think it's just because of the very, very low sampling. Now, look at the noise levels. How many of you tune the 95th percentile? Nobody? 95th percentile? A few hands, thank you. What is the problem if you're tuning the 95th percentile? If there's 7% very, very slow navigations, where the performance is degraded because the browser also decided to degrade, you're basically looking at trying to tune the performance of hidden pages. And you're doing whatever you want, and you don't see change in numbers. Or you ask yourself, why is it 13 seconds? Like, is there some query at the P99, which is taking multiple seconds, is my CDN slower, is, can be anything. So that adds that those very fast, slow navigations add some noise to your data. So my advice is only focus on always visible. And same here, these four pages, the noise levels, again, can change based on the page you're looking at. Because one solution might be, oh, then let's not, let's not look at the 95th percentile, let's look at the 90th percentile, problem solved. If I do that on my home page, there the noise is 10%. So the 90th percentile is likely a hidden or partially hidden navigation. Again, here, search. Search was already faster than I thought, than reality, because it contained a lot of very fast back-forward navigations. In this case, 
it also looks faster than the rest. Why? Because it has relatively fewer slow, very slow ones. So for years I thought my search is fine. The reality was that it was not that as fine as I thought. And bottom one, same thing. Here there was a difference. And why is that? Again, on a, uh, for example, for product detail pages, if you, what do people do? They right click, open a new window, right click, open a new window. And that's the impact of that. Now, I know, Tim, your website is different. If you're looking at the RUM archive data, or in this case, RUM insights, which awesome Robin, and I really love Robin, so uh, if awesome Robin uh, made, is basically, um, here you see like 15% of, uh, of noise, which is basically more than what you just saw. So the impact here with 15% is you already need to go like to the 85th, 90th percentile before you get rid of that noise. And on desktop, it's a little bit uh, less. Back to that fake, these fake numbers, what happens is that noise adds at the, sorry, this part of the screen, adds some very, very slow navigations. And this results, if you're looking at the P95, it skews your P95. It skews your P75. It skews your P50. And then for the very slow ones, it does not, does not have any, any impact. And here is whatever you do to tune is if you're looking at the P95 and like, why is it not changing? If you're looking at Metstock, we want to improve, we want to reduce the digital divide, we want to make sure that our 95th percentile is as fast as possible. Good luck if you're trying to make it faster for always visible, uh, for the, the noise ones. Next is human. And real user monitoring somehow means for me real users, so you exclude bots. And there's one bot everybody cares about, which is, which is the only bot people care about, is the Google Crawler. Here you see Google Crawler visiting my website, and they're welcome. Come as much as you want, because the more Google comes to my website, the more money I make, which is good. And I tuned for performance for bots as well, but I don't use real user monitoring for it. Why? Because Google Bot does not run run beacons by default. Why would they spend time on running run beacons? The only thing they want to do is crawl the HTML, and basically that's, that's it. So that's not the problem. So I also don't need to worry about Google hitting the website too much. It does not add up in the data. And a lot of bots, I would say also other stupid bots, they just crawl the HTML. For example, my website, I also show 3 million price comparisons. So what do bots try to do? They try to scrape my website and based on that make decisions of how, they, how much they should sell their product for. That's one thing. Another thing is I have a huge database with a lot of product information, like barcodes and when things were released. Other websites like to consume slash steal that information to make their websites better. Now, a lot of those bots don't execute JavaScript, which is fine. But some of them, they try to pretend to be browsers to get not detected. So what do they do? They do basically everything a normal browser would do, and they will also execute run beacons. And here is an example. And the problem is, remember that noise level was 1%, so it's 1% of the noise. That's in theory like neglectable. The problem is that bots are unpredictable. The noise levels might be zero now, and 80% for the next hour. They might not hit the home page, but only product detail pages. So their traffic patterns are completely, completely different. And what you're seeing here is a CLS spike due to bots. Somewhere, 
I don't remember which date. Grey's Anatomy season whatever. I took my laptop, deploy, 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 making changes, trying to get CLS to zero, and I do a change somewhere later on. So the next day, what do I do? I look at my data and I compare the timings, the right timings, right? Looking apples to apples, I look at the right. And I saw degradation in CLS. And I didn't understand why, and sometimes CLS is difficult to understand, but the values were like, there was no doubt, RUM never lies. I had a degradation in CLS. So I rolled back. A few evenings later, luckily my wife was then looking at season 37, I found the issue, and what was the problem? This was a German bot, and that German bot used a older version of Chrome, which had some CLS issues not being fixed. So all normal users were on the fixed thing. Maybe a small percentage normal users is there, but each time that bot hit the website, the amount of CLS issues increased. Why? Because I had suddenly a lot more measurements with that bad bot data. So, thing is, get rid of bots. So, 78% human visible navigation. By default, and that's the keyword, by default, whenever I do an analysis, I only focus on the middle part. No reloads, no back-forward navigations. Exclude the bots and only look at stuff which is visible. And your life will be a lot easier. And if you combine these two, because I remove noise at the beginning, I remove noise at the end, if you combine these two, you will see that your performance is actually a lot, lot different. So the fastest percentiles get a little bit slower the slowest percentiles get a little bit faster, and somewhere in the middle, if you look at the P75, it happens to collide a lot. Now, I don't know, we're just looking at the P75, which is good. If you're just looking at the P75, you will miss anyway some things, but if you would only look at the P75 and you would ignore everything, everything I say, then this is still a problem. Why? Because it depends on the page. This is on overall, this happens to collide. But if on some pages it's 20%, on others it's 5%, you will never know what are the noise levels, so just skip it. Now, I said already a few times irrelevant data. And Barry sitting at the front, He's a big fan of back-forward cache. He's getting a little bit nervous each time I'm saying, ignore back-forward cache, ignore back-forward cache, ignore back-forward cache. And the thing is, it's irrelevant data for many of your analysis, but for some, it might not. You might also ask, if it's irrelevant, why do, you, why do RUM tools even capture this data? Like, why should I be bothered filtering it out? Shouldn't RUM tools just get rid of this data? And the answer is no, because often it's irrelevant, but it can actually also be relevant. And then the noise becomes the signal. For example, back forward noise. If you're tuning waiting time, LCP, all those things, that's fine. CLS, cumulative layout shift. A lot of the cumulative layout shifts happen when people hit the back button. Do you care about those layout shifts? Absolutely yes. So for waiting time and tuning the CDN, it's noise. For CLS, it's not noise. Another thing is, I want these back forward caches to be fast. Because I want, to, I, I want the back-forward navigations to be fast. Why? I want, ideally, the back-forward cache to be used. And it should be instant. So, I of course, check if I... Oh, sometimes I only zoom in on back-forward caches, and I validate, are my back-forward caches actually as fast as I expect? And if it's fast for 80%, great. And if 20% is slow, 
then I need to find out why are those not instant, because I'm leaving performance on the table. The 6% visibility state. I never, ever, ever look at what is the performance of visibility state hidden. But I do care about the percentage of that noise. Because typically, if this, the bigger this number is, the slower your website. Or the more annoying your website loads. Because if your page loads very slowly and shifts around, what do people do? If that would happen on my website, I would say right-click, open a new window, right-click, open a new window, and they wait a bit, and then they go in there. So if that noise level increases, could be an indication that your users are frustrated by the loading of the page. Now, you can't get this to zero, but the faster it is, the slower, the fewer chances people actually have to switch tabs. And the bottom one, at uh, the top one, the 1%, when do I look at bots? Rarely. If it would be a security conference, we could now talk for ages about this, but from a performance perspective, I always get rid of the noise. Another reason why you can't remove those from RUM at all, those are still valid navigations. So if you compare RUM data with business metric, things like bounce rate, conversion, session length, the, all these navigations are still valid from a business perspective. So this brings me to the end of my talk. So noise cancelling RUM is, yes, I love real user monitoring, but you need to remove three sources of noise. Is make sure to look at multiple percentiles, because if you're just looking at one, you make yourself some troubles. Two, make sure to always compare apples to apples. So weekdays, think about weekdays versus weekends. And then three, by default, for many of the optimizations, focus on human visible navigations and only look at the rest for things like CLS or validating the back forward cache. With that, if you would like to follow me, I'm on Mastodon, Twitter, LinkedIn, under Tim Vereke. And I would say thank you very, very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. That was amazing talk. Thank, Thank you, you so yeah. much. Are you ready for some questions? Definitely. All right. Oh, and as a reminder, if you do have questions, you can submit them online with hashtag perfnow and uh, hashtag. on the website. <laughs> um, so would a fair summary be make sure you're measuring what you think you're measuring? And then considering that, are there any other sources of noise that might be common ones that people miss when analyzing their data? Other sources of noise, yes. There, uh, for example, um, I once did a talk on responsive RUM, where we all expect that people on a mobile device look at the mobile um, version of the website, which is not true, or on desktop that people look on the always load the large version of the website, mm -hmm. sometimes it's small. So um, yeah, there you can also have some, some, um, some noise. For example, on desktop, we always think desktop is also means fast connection. In RUM data, you can still have somebody in rural areas who is using a satellite connection on, on desktop. So that could be, other, could be another reason for noise. Yeah, um, and then a good kind of technical one, but how do you determine if a visitor is a human or a bot? How I determine that is, I will now speak for the, um, I, one is user agent, a lot of the bots might just say, hey, I'm a crawler, get rid of that. For example, if you run web page tests, you can change the user agent, so you could filter that out, that's one thing. And then I know on the Akamai side, uh, we can, Akamai has like bot detection tools based on uh, plenty of other patterns, and that can be injected in the run data as well. Oh, cool. Uh, and then do you know if uh, other data sets like the Chrome User Experience Report share any way to filter out noise or understand how much noise might exist? Um, so what I know is, uh, for example, for CLS in Crux, does contain your back forward navigations because that mm -hmm. that 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 matters. So for yeah, CLS, yeah, yeah, yeah. it's not noise. I think for LCP and um, the Google folks might um, um, correct me, but if LCP uh, LCP if it's on a hidden 
if it's on a hidden page or partially hidden page, then it's, in my view, not included in Crux. So for LCP, mm -hmm. it's filtered out. Okay. CLS? CLS is filtered out and IMP is included. Right. F for yep. reasons. That's another talk, likely. In <laughs> case you missed that last part. <laughs> Um, and then we, we have a, a, a good question from Pat here. <laughs> Since he's sitting on the first row, I should ask it. <laughs> oh, okay, cool. I don't, okay, good. I do have a very important question to ask you. What's a good intro scale model to try out while my partner is watching Keeping Up with the Kardashians? <laughs> I would say an Airfix model of a Spitfire in one scale, 1 to 72. And that would be an airplane? That would be an airplane. Oh, yes. good. See, I'm <laughs> at least a little smart. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for your time. Everyone, please give uh, Tim a round, another round of applause. Thank you. Thank you.